something out of it. Good booze and. Maybe oh, you guys didn't dress up, huh? No. Uh, because I, I put a lot of work into this costume here. Oh, Tom, that's really nice. <laughs> Thanks. It's really nice. Yeah. It's all right. I'll, uh, I'll just... See I would like what to... you audio-only people miss? I would love to do a costume that had prosthetics, like, you know, like things you glue to your face or, like, creepy limbs. Oh, gosh. But I'm not good at stuff like that's that. That's what I want. So. Creepy limbs. That reminds me of the Orville episode. Yeah, see, I don't want any weird stuff on here. Not in the face. Man, I try yeah, watching. Like, I'm worried about touching it. And what if you're like allergic to the, the like, latex? Yeah. Something in there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still, are you still watching that. Orville? Yeah. I have a, I, well, I, I, I was a couple episodes behind. So I'm still, I think, one episode behind. But I watched one last night. I have to force myself to watch and I don't really enjoy it all that much yeah i haven't been forcing myself but last night i was like oh the baseball game isn't on eileen's not home caught up on most of the really essential stuff i guess i'll watch orville why not i finally caught up on discovery i thought uh this week's star trek discovery was great Yes, Mud has taken on entirely new. Mud and a time travel episode that was definitely one that's been done before, but they did it in a different way. I was impressed. I, I really like the tone. I, I know people might disagree, but I prefer this tone than kind of what they, they had going in Enterprise and TNG. Yeah. Well, friends, I think that the show is not autonomous and therefore we'll have to do it ourselves. <laughs> it's okay. I like being in the driver's seat. <laughs> We're going to talk about that and more. You guys ready? Yeah. Yes. Here the go. A Nicholas show keeps you in the know. If you'd like to find out more, please go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support and find out how to keep us on the air. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 31st, Halloween 2017. I'm Tom Merritt from DTNS headquarters in Los Angeles. And from Studio Feline at the beach in Los Angeles as well. I'm Sarah Lane and I'm not in costume. I'm sorry. I am dressed up as a podcaster. Roger Chang, what are you dressed up as? I'm dressed up as decent. You are decently dressed. Yes. Are you decent? Yes. The answer yes. to that is yes. Good, good costume. Uh, we're going to talk about autonomy, drones, and cargo ships, and cargo planes, and cargo pants. Maybe not the last, but let's start with a few tech things you should know. Image sensor company Sony says it expects to book its highest ever profit this year. The full year forecast was raised 26% to 630 billion yen. Strong sales of those image sensors and high-end TV sets led the way. Sony is boosting investments in AI robotics. Remember, there's those return of the IBO rumors, as well as automotive sensors to, to keep those image sensors selling strong. It's an interesting way to describe Sony. Oh, yeah. No, that's where they make all their money. So I do have fun calling them an image sensor company. But. Hey, you know, majority rules. Apple released iOS 11.1, .1, which is the first major update to the iOS 11 uh, update <laughs> that happened about a month ago. The update addresses the crack vulnerability, among other things, and adds new Unicode 10 emojis. Some of them are very strange. Apple also released watchOS 4.1 with LTE Apple Music Streaming, a new radio app, gym kit support, security fixes, and a new Wi-Fi toggle in Control Center. Hmm. I have to check out that watch update. Uh, chip maker Samsung co-CEOs J.K. Shin and Yoon Bu Kyun will step down. Now, they are two of the three CEOs. Samsung generally does have three CEOs. It's kind of the way they've done things, but one of them had already stepped down. The other two have now stepped down. Three new CEOs were named. Kim Ki Nam will lead Device Solutions. Ko Dong Jin will head IT and Mobile Communications. And Kim Hyun Suk will lead Consumer Electronics. Chief Financial Officer Lee Sang Hoon has been recommended as a new board chairman. Samsung reported its biggest operating profit ever in its third quarter, nearly tripling to 14.53 trillion won. It's about $12.92 billion due to strong demand for its memory chips and other components. That's where it makes most of its money. I mean, it always sounds pretty impressive to be like best quarter ever in profit. Yeah. 
Um, We're firing all of our leaders. One of them's in jail. Best quarter ever, though. It, it does, though. I mean, wasn't it just about a year ago now, though, that Note 7s were lighting yeah. themselves on fire? So it's, right. it's, it's right. impressive, at least on paper. Here's some more top stories. Take it away, Sarah. All right. Back to Apple. The iPhone 10 or iPhone X, however you want to call it, reviews are out. The first ones, anyway. And generally, reviewers thought, hey, this is a good phone. It's fast. Cameras are good. Screen looks great. Most of them say, though, Face ID works well enough, but a few, like the Verge's Neelai Patel, found some issues. Neelai is being in low lighting. Another issue I read was it might confuse you and your identical twin. So but they, are, they already warned us of that. Come on. <laughs> Not going to apply to me, but hey, it might apply to you. <laughs> or does it? Sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't talk about my twin. <laughs> Opinions differed over the gesture used to replace the home button, but it does seem like the kind of thing people will get used to over time. That tends to be the case anyway. A fact that also seems true for the notch, which some folks are saying is a little ugly. Yeah, but a, a couple of different people I read felt like they were begrudgingly admitted that they stopped noticing it over the course of using it. They're like, yeah, sure. it's ugly, but then I stopped noticing it after a while. You know, I felt that same way when the I when at first, when the camera stuck out the back, mm -hmm. because uh, at one point it was flush. The bump. Yep. I, I can't imagine that bothering me anymore, but it bothered me for the first month. Uh, the Essential Phone has a smaller notch, uh, but that notch bugged me the first time I used it. And I don't even think about it anymore until just now. Um, so yeah, I I think these are the kind of things that are more like, ah, oh, it's a change, I don't like it. And everyone expects there to be important information, the most important information in every app will be hidden under the notch somehow. And I don't think that's how it's gonna play out. So um, overall, these, these are more positive reviews than I expected, to be honest. Uh, I thought there might be some battery life issues or because of the high expectations, people might say, well, the screen's good, but it's not that good. Uh, and, and granted, I don't see anyone saying this is the best phone ever made, but I have seen a couple of reviews say this is this is the top smartphone out there right now. You know, another thing that I noticed too, and this of course is you know coming from people who are, have previously reviewed iPhones and kind of been known for reviewing iPhones, grumbling that they weren't in the first wave of review units. And it sounds like Apple has changed strategy a little bit. Um, thinking about uh, people with large YouTube reaches, for example, or other kinds of celebrities who might be able to to spread the good word about the yeah. phone um, and not rely on, you know, the same five people who've been doing this forever. I mean, I think that's great. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not so great if you're John Gruber, I get it, but uh, right. it, it's great that they're expanding. Uh, I remember when they used to really just give it to Walt Mossberg and David Pogue, and that was kind of it, yeah. right? And then they eventually expanded from that. So I don't know, maybe they'll expand to um, Patreon supported podcasts at some point. That would be nice. Who knows? Uh, Facebook, Google, and Twitter will testify to the U.S. Congress this week about the extent of ads and posts related to the 2016 election that originated in Russia. Tuesday, that's today if you're listening live, uh, Facebook General Counsel Colin Stretch, Google Director of Law Enforcement and Info Security Richard Salgado, and Acting General Counsel at Twitter Sean Edgett will speak with Senator Lindsey Graham's Crime and Terrorism Subcommittee. On Wednesday, Google General Counsel Kent Walker will swap in uh, for Richard Salgado. Delgado, and then uh, Twitter's edge it and Facebook stretch will head back for back-to-back -back sessions before the House and Senate Intelligence Committee. So House and Senate back-to-back. -back. The gist of the testimony is really well documented on Recode in advance, but essentially they're saying there are more ads and more non-paid posts than we thought, but we still think they make up a very small percentage of the information people saw at the time. Well, it's hard to quantify this, I guess, in a sense where it's like, did I see an ad that was served to me? You know, based on well, it's your it's ad. You look at reach. And you look at reach, and you do surveys and stuff like that. Um, I, I yeah. think I think you're right, though. Like they're not being very solid in that assessment. They're just saying, well, people saw, you know, I, I think Twitter's got got a number on it, like a very small percentage of the things of the ads they saw were these ads were these questionable ads mm -hmm. so well, yeah in twitter's estimation that's less than three quarters of a percent of all the election sampled tweets sent using its service 
over a two month window. So I, you know, I'm not trying to minimize this, but I do, th I, I am trying to <laughs> moderate it. And I, I, I think that there's a lot of people saying that this obviously changed the election. And I'm not sure that's true. I also agree, however, that I don't like uh, people in a foreign country trying to affect our election, even if they weren't successful. So I would mm -hmm. like that to be stopped or at least made transparent somehow so so that it, it, it can be called attention to. I do wonder, and this is just a wonder, how many of these Russian-based tweets, because every story I read says, well, it's Kremlin. And granted, they are organizations, often like uh, the Internet Research Agency, that have ties to the Russian government, but it's not the government itself. And if you add to that the fact that so many people use Russian-based organizations for their marketing campaigns because they can, you know, get a Russian IP address and get around some blocks and this and that. I, I wonder if there are other organizations, whether domestically or other foreign organizations involved, that are hiding what they did or hiding their purchases by sending it through Russia, the way you would hide a malware path by making it look like the IP address is in Russia. There's also just the, I, I know that there's uh, a, a part of the public who will always be very skeptical of uh, a corporation like Facebook having their best interests at heart. So you've got Mark Zuckerberg saying, what? No, that's, there's no problem here. That's ludicrous. And now there being a subcommittee and, and these companies, not just Facebook, but Google and Twitter as well, testifying to Congress. It'll be interesting to see how they explain why that was so unclear to the companies at first, at least the numbers. Yeah. So, I, I mean, in the end, technology wise, right, you know, most of this discussion is political, but technology wise, the question is, what are the numbers? What can we tell from those numbers? What we do with what we can tell from those numbers is is left to the political arena. Go, go listen to Justin Robert Young on politics, politics, politics for that. But these numbers are going to tell you what percentage of what people saw were from these questionable Russian based accounts. And mm -hmm. and and that's that's good data. That's good data to, to to go with. And it's good to get this in front of Congress and and get it in front of the the people so so that we have more information to base our conclusions on. I just hope people realize that having some information is not having all the information. Right, right. It's like saying because email spam exists, then everyone is is falling for email spam. It's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, depends on the person, depends on on the spam, I guess. Microsoft will launch a Surface Pro with built-in LTE Advanced next month. The company announced it at its future decoded event, which is happening in London this week. Also stressed the importance of the Surface as a mobile office because it's a pretty robust machine. The new Pro will feature a Cat9 modem and support for 20 cellular bands. That's kind of for people who are doing a lot of global travel, uh, right? And they have to have a lot of access to bands with download speeds of up to 450 megabits per second, pretty fast. The new Surface Pro starts at $1,149 for an Intel i5, six gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of uh, solid state drive, or you can double your RAM and your SSD storage for $1,449. I, the, reading this today uh, didn't surprise me that that we would have a more business oriented surface coming out. Uh, I, and, and I love the idea of, you know, a, a tablet hybrid that has LTE built in. Why not? You've got LTE built into so many tablets. This makes sense. But I'm wondering if we are starting to head into the world where most laptops you buy will have LTE built in. Uh, and, you know, would Apple do this with the MacBooks? Will, would we see more of these options from HP and Dell? Uh, will this become the norm? I'm not certain because while on the one hand, yes, I always want the option to do that. We still don't see the business plan that says, hey, we've made it cheap and easy. You can just turn it on and off. You could pay for a, a day pass at a reasonable price if you don't want to con consistently be subscribing to it. I, that's the kind of thing I would want. I, I'm just going to use Wi-Fi at home. But when I'm traveling, when I'm out at the airport, I'd love to be able to say, yeah, turn on my billing for you know $4 today and I'll get my unlimited LTE all day until I get to the hotel and I can get on their Wi-Fi. I think it also depends on what company we're talking about you know you mentioned you know would macbooks have this sort of capability in the future well you know apple already likes us to have lots of different devices that do different things um so you know I, i've never even really thought about it all that much right because i'm always traveling with my with my iphone but i and i also think it's 
I always tether to my iPhone too. You're right. But it would just be nice to have it right there. I think it absolutely would. I also don't travel internationally as much as certain people, you know, who would be using a surface pro for business. I just went to London for the, for a weekend. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, there, there are people who are a little bit more of global jet setters than we are. And I think this is a device that's at least Microsoft is saying, Hey, you know, this is, this is a super professional device. You know, your, your download speeds are going to be screaming fast, better than ever. You're not going to have any cellular issues switching from country to country. So it's a real sort of pro user type of device. You know, talking about the fact that it sounds like the T-Mobile Sprint merger uh, is not going to happen. And, and, and what does Sprint do if they, if they're left, to their own devices to get back in the game. Can they pull off a T-Mobile like turnaround? Maybe this is part of a plan is to become the the really user friendly temporary provider of data for multiple devices like this. Make it really easy uh, for for people to to add LTE to their devices. I think that'd be great. I'm all for it. Sign me up. Wall Street Journal reports that Apple is designing iPhones and iPads next year that would have Intel or media tech chips inside instead of Qualcomm. Now, this isn't the first report we've heard about this, but Wall Street Journal usually has pretty good sources. Qualcomm has supposedly withheld software critical to testing chips for iPhone and iPad prototypes after Apple filed its federal lawsuit in January. If you remember, Apple is accusing Qualcomm of using its market dominance unfairly to block competitors and collect patent royalties. Apple instructed its partners not to pay the royalties, so now Qualcomm's countersuing Apple and all of the partners, and it's a big old mess. I would not be surprised if at Apple they're like, if there's any way we can just stop giving any money to Qualcomm, let's do it. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, you got legal troubles between the two companies. However, that shakes out, you would think that Apple would be like, if we can switch over to Intel and what was the other company, MediaTek? MediaTek, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, with, with you know, and keep our margins fairly similar, uh, you know, as long as, as long as the chips work. What if you were one of the uh, smaller suppliers? You would just constantly want to be in Apple's good graces, just in case, I'm like, if it's, a, if, if Apple is a big chunk uh, of your um, clientele, uh, I'm I'm just curious because it's uh, on the one hand it's basically one uh, component company versus Apple, right? And that they have a dispute. I could see this in the future being kind of a anti-competitive thing. If like, oh, you're working with so and so, so we'll probably just not use your particular component in our device. You think Apple could be con accused of being anti-competitive? Not not with this case, but if you take it, if they do this with someone with 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 another supplier, that yeah, but maybe... I mean, okay, they did that with Imagination, right? And Imagination yeah. went out basically went out of business. They they sold themselves off to venture capitalists. But I mean, a company should be free to choose the supplier that fits it best, shouldn't they? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, oh no, no. But the the. the it's it's, it's hard like to because Apple is, is, Apple it is easy for Apple to accuse another company of doing something and in order to kind of get them out of the supply chain. Well, Apple is such a large player. It'd be one thing if it were like a Lenovo or uh, even a, 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 a Moto. Like, uh, I mean, Lenovo sells more laptops than Apple, though. And, and, and I, I think Samsung sells more smartphones than Apple. Yes, that's true. So you 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 would probably wouldn't see an issue going down the road like if they did this to I mean like, if if somebody I don't know I mean saying to a company if you don't give us better licensing terms we're taking our business elsewhere is only antitrust if there's no other competitors and I don't see Apple as being monopolistic in any of these particular verticals all right. Well, in happier news, if you don't really like driving, Waymo ha is making strides in its self-driving cars. In fact, invited a bunch of reporters yesterday to its testing center at the Formal Castle Air Force, uh, which is in Merced, California. It's in the Central Valley of California. The demonstration including letting report included letting reporters ride around and test neighborhoods. We kind of have some intersections set up, railroad crossings, other vehicles, uh, pretend pedestrians, which Tom coined a really good term before the show called 
pretendstrians, so we'll be using that in the future, while nobody sat in the driver's seat. So you really got a sense in a safe arena, or at least safer than some regular old street in your, in your hometown, to get a sense of what autonomous vehicles will be like one day. Waymo announced no significant new information about its plan, so, you know, kind of more of a press event. I found this to be intriguing on the one hand, because what a, what a smart move to use an old Air Force base, which had an area for the people to live on the base, right? Most Air Force mm -hmm. bases have that, have houses and intersections and stop signs and crosswalks and even roundabouts, apparently. So right. it's like, how brilliant is that to have right. a real test? It's kind and, of, a, it's like a built-in ghost town that you can- Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, what, who who doesn't want the job of like, we want you to be a pretendstrian, just walk around, walk around out there and don't get hit by a car. <laughs> um, and so I, I totally get what Waymo is doing is like, let's throw, we feel we're confident enough in this uh, and it's safe enough to do it in our own test location to throw some reporters in the back of a car and go, there is going to be nobody in that driver's seat. Check it out. And I read a couple of different reports from different people on this and they were all impressed. They're like, yeah, at first I was a little freaked out that there was nobody in the driver's seat, but after a while it felt perfectly safe. Now, of course, this is different than having it out on the open road and doing that. But that's all it was. It was a way to impress reporters like, hey, this really works. Yeah. They, Waymo I, didn't announce anything. At the same, exactly. That's the thing is like, it, it's really sort of a goodwill. Hey, we're feeling good about how this is all working. At the same time, I wonder how much of it might have felt a little theme parky. Um, you know, you're sitting in the back of a car, you're kind of like, well, it's kind of do its thing. You know, we're sort of on a, we're on a little course here that, that Waymo feels very confident. You know, we're not going to say anything bad about. So until it's real life, it still is you know, it's, you are on a bit of a track, but I get what you're saying, Tom, that this is more like how a town might be laid out than just some, you know, random field, uh, which would be safer, but not uh, really applicable to real life. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's closer to real life. And if you look it's at the closer. pictures, like, you know, it looks like a real neighborhood. Uh, and I don't got trees and houses say, and... oh, if Waymo wanted to, you know, really knock my socks off, they should just do this in a densely populated part of my, part of my... <laughs> no, no, I really wanted to, I wanted to really work first Yeah. because, you know, I'm not a pretendstrian, I'm a real one. You're a real lens dream. I'm, I'm a real person who could be hit by a car, but yeah, it, it's, um, <laughs> I want that on a shirt. I, I definitely think that this points to Waymo saying, hey, we're getting close here. We want reporters to talk about it. We want we we, we feel confident that they're not going to be freaked out. They're going to be impressed and and they're going to tell people about it. Yeah, man, I, I, I agree. I, I, I think it is important for Waymo to put some real people in the backs of these things and go, no, for real, check it out. This works, right? But I'm mm -hmm. not sure how useful that is for the rest of us who weren't in the car. I mean, it's it's kind of nice to be like, okay, this is a you know an independent reporter who who says that, but it's it's very yeah, controlled. Right. It's very yeah, controlled. yeah, it's very controlled. And so the the idea is, yeah, you get to see Waymo's technology at its best. Um, but the question that everyone wants to know is, how's it going to handle when someone's golden retriever darts in the middle of the road chasing after a ball or a little kid who doesn't look both ways when crossing the street? Or, for example, if they used like the Presidio in San Francisco, which used to, is a decommissioned U.S. Army base and has a lot of the same housing, there's a lot of curvy roads with a lot of trees and stones and not necessarily cleaned, high-contrast divisions between the actual road, the sidewalk, the intersection. How would it deal with that? And so, well, and people still live in the Presidio too. Um, so this is a great first step, but it's still a controlled setting, and I would say uber controlled because yeah, they're you know. I mean, I, I'll and, disagree with you a little bit in that I think there are some people who don't believe this works at all, and Waymo is definitely addressing them. Like, no, it really does work. You can really not have somebody in the driver's seat. Um, but you're right, they're the. People like us who've been following it a lot are like, sure, okay, but what about the deer that drives around? What about the the crumbling road who whose markers are all messed up? What what about that? What about and I'm Jersey? sure Waymo, because Waymo does real life tests, I'm sure they're going to address that as well. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to Daily Tech Headlines at dailytechheadlines.com. You can get it as an anchor app, anchor.fm. You can get it in the Amazon Echo. Uh, you can get it on the Google Home through Anchor. And you can get it as a podcast. Just subscribe, dailytechheadlines.com. 
And that's a look at our top stories. All right, Joe the Pilot sent us a link to an avgeekery.com article about China's JD.com. They're sometimes called the Amazon of China. Sometimes they're called the eBay of China. Neither one really fit. They're probably more like Amazon, but they're, they're an e-commerce site. They're a big e-commerce site in China. JD is testing an unmanned cargo plane, the AT200. In a test flight, the drone had a takeoff weight of 3.4 tons with a 1.5 ton payload. China's Institute of Engineering Thermophysics says it flew for 26 minutes with automatic takeoff and landing, and it is uh, capable of reaching speeds up to 313 kilometers per hour and a flight range of 2,183 kilometers and a 6,098 meter service ceiling. Uh, JD intends to use the drones to deliver groups of packages that would then be delivered to their final destination by ground. So while you have uh, companies like in Rwanda, like Zipline, doing quadcopter delivery of medical supplies or the post office in Switzerland uh, doing that, this is more of a let's let's use the unmanned aerial, aerial vehicle as the trunk line. Uh, and then we'll have delivery guys at the end, or delivery ladies at the end, uh, taking it by wheel. I don't know if it's always going to be bicycle or motorcycle or truck or whatever, um, but but it would use it would use the drone to get get you across the large distances. And these are big, Sarah. These are a big old plane. They're huge. Yeah. When I uh, when I opened the article, I was like, oh my goodness, that's you know that's 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 a plane. <laughs> That is that is a self flying plane, and and obviously a company like JD and the fact that China is a very large, large country. There's a lot of distance that needs to be covered. If you're talking about replacing most of what, let's say, a truck driver would be traveling with a unmanned vehicle, and then yeah, somebody picks it up at the very end and and delivers that you know last mile, so to speak. Well, it's attractive for the company. I guess what's it struck me most about this particular article is not so much that, oh, this is so different than what Amazon's trying to do. And I know we talk about Amazon drones landing your packages in your backyard or at your front door, that sort of thing. It makes more sense to me that they'll be going to, you know, regional warehouses and then having people deliver kind of in the same way that it sounds like JD is doing. It's just the fact that the plane is so big, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, several tons it's going 313 kilometers per hour. Uh, you know, it has a pretty big range. It's it's this is a big vehicle flying itself in the air. Yeah, uh, I, I think it was uh, in in Joe's email that he sent me that he would lobby to call it a a B A M F. You can work out that anagram on your own. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, uh, this is a drone. I I generally try to avoid calling quadcopters drones because drone can mean a big unmanned military vehicle which is used for military purposes and when we're talking about quadcopters delivering blood samples calling it a drone to me doesn't sound right granted this is not you being used for a military purpose but this is a big vehicle uh and so this feels more like a drone this is like a non-military drone versus a little a little quadcopter which is a lot more flexible can get in a lot more locations well, what's interesting is this effectively allows the company to create an air uh, transit uh, cargo carrying corridor without necessarily relying on government agencies to maintain and upkeep roads and, of course, paying truck drivers to drive uh, the, the load from one point A to point B. And this will allow them to kind of do what airlines do. They do a hub and spoke. So you land all these plane drones, cargo drones in one airport, and then they would radiate out from there, whatever. If there's roads enough, they'll take trucks. If not, they'll go by some other form of, of carriage. But this actually, I mean, especially because the east, uh, the western half of China isn't as developed as the eastern half, access roads and, and you know, roads that have at capacity enough space and uh, enough low carrying capacity, to, like what we do in the U.S., where we can drive trucks 24-7, um, isn't an option, not only in China, but this could help them uh, in other regions of the uh, world where they don't have as developed uh, network of roads. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in any way, like emailing a story like this, uh, or in our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com, or even in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Tech News Show. We love hearing from you. Uh, we value your input, good or bad. Uh, hopefully the bad is constructive. That's that's the better way. Uh, and we get some really good, thoughtful feedback from folks of all kinds. So thank you for that. Let's move on to our message of the day, Sarah. 
All right, this one comes from Franz, who says, hello to the assembled DTNS crew. Hello, Franz. Franz is an Outlook Premium customer. He says, only for personalized email domain, though. Just my personal use. I made the move because I like Gmail and Outlook rather than setting up a dedicated or hosted mail server or use the clunky webmail that domain hosters still offer nowadays. I'm using one as well, Franz. Uh, since I don't operate a business springing for a G Suite or an office business plan, just too expensive at the time. I'm glad that existing c customers can continue using the feature, but if fellow listeners have other suggestions, I am all ears. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, this is the good side of Microsoft saying, we're pretty much rolling the features into Office 365 and getting rid of the domain thing unless you're on a bigger plan. But for Franz and <laughs> people like him, uh, we're going to continue to offer the service. And that this would have been an angry email from him otherwise. Sure. Uh, and, and so I think that's great. But I, I do think it's interesting that he's like, but it leaves me enough unsettled to know to wonder, like, anybody else, you know, got, got other alternatives? Obviously, he knows about G Suites, uh, but that's a little much for him. So if there is a comparable domain managed email provider and that's all it is uh i know hover.com offers something similar but it's not nearly as feature filled as as uh as outlook premium was uh let us know feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and you know what uh this is an auspicious day because it's the last day of october sarah how's your first month feel Felt really good, Tom. Yeah, started uh, DTNS full time uh, right at the beginning of the month. It was October second because that was the Monday, and um, it's been a wonderful month. Um, I I'm having a great time. Uh, this is you know it's sort of the the well not to make myself sound not interesting, but it's like the best part of my day every day during the weekday anyway. Uh, and um, you know looking forward to keeping it rolling through November. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks to you, we will keep it rolling. Uh, as of this moment, we have two more patrons than we had last month. And that's always our ongoing goal is to get at least one more patron as last month. So don't anybody go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> keep keep your places and uh, and we'll meet that goal for tomorrow. And don't forget, we also have a new another milestone goal. If you liked our roundtable show on Friday, uh, and I know a lot of you did, we got a lot of great feedback about it. We would like to do that more often. Uh, and we heard the feedback of people who are like, hey, I still want a little news in there, so we'll, we'll take care of that next month. Uh, but yeah, we could do that roundtable more often if we hit that next milestone at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you want to give us feedback, ask us questions, correct us, or any of any of the three or others, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And, of course, our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow with Chris Ashley from the SMR Podcast. Talk to you then. show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Still funny. Makes <laughs> me laugh every time. <laughs> that Brian Brushwood, we need to get him back on the show. Um, I'm going to do Night Attack uh, on the 14th. This uh, the November fourteenth. So steal him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell him to reply to me. My emails. <laughs> oh, that's the problem with booking Brian Brushwood. Is how do you get his attention? Well, to, to be fair, Brian did not email me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, I know. so I have technically not pinned him down either, but I also haven't tried that. But but yeah, he's a busy man. Yeah, you have to talk to him in person. Like if I if he was here right now listening. He'd say, well, of course I'll be on when, and then we'd figure it out. Mm. Um, but yeah, we'll do that. What should we call this show though? Um, I think there was a issue with Showbot, um, but oh, right no. now the uh, the top or what was uh, DTNS Spooktacular. It was just a weekend pretend, pretendstrian, pretendstrian. Uh, hey, leave my ID. Hey, face hey, ID, leave my twin ID. Face ID. Leave my twins out of the... No, it's not trying to be a Pink Floyd thing. Never mind. <laughs> Keep it rolling through November. Pretend. Pretendstrian. 
I did. I I really did think that that was a funny thing. It's like, well, you know what? You know who's going to have a hard time? Twins. <laughs> you know, now, I like I that Apple like, addressed listen, it. Like, I know some folks are twins, or yeah. maybe have twins, or know a set of twins. Might be triplets. Maybe so. Quadruplets. Even right? more of a problem. Sharing phones. But uh, but it 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 did make me chuckle a little bit. Um, you know, something like, hey, in low light, face ID might not work very well. I'd be like, that's really oh, okay. Good so the infrared sensor, maybe that as a software update could fix that, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Twins, well, unless you are one, not a big problem. Right. <laughs> and also, like, what are you going to do? What's the what's the uh, workaround? Don't be a twin? Like, right, yeah. Like, Sam someone's got to change their face and fast. <laughs> Samsung offers, like, a discount uh, to tripl or twins, triplets, quadruplets on their next Galaxy phone. Yeah. We don't um, discriminate. I, I mean, we could call this episode Pretendstrian. Am I being too... Um, I, I like the term pretendstrian. I think it's... Looks cool. like you're going to get hit by a car that's piloted by no one. Nobody. Probably not going to get hit by a car. But... Not on those roads. If you did. <laughs> I, Castle Air Force Base, I remember. That's where they used to fly the B-52s and KC-135s. I, I resisted saying this, but Merced is where Sawyer the dog is from. Really? Mm -hmm. That's where they found him on the streets, skin and bones. Oh, buddy. Yeah. Um, I, gosh, I don't know. I don't know when I've been to Merced. I've been through it, kind of. I've been I've been in Merced exactly six times. Six? We've all, yes. We've all been to the Merced in our minds. <laughs> where uh, the, one of the guys that was uh, the head of the local... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, society SCA was that, and that's Society for Creative Anachronisms. Yeah, they did the medieval stuff. They did all the they sword go medieval on you. And armor. He had to, like he had like three, he had three Clydesdales, like for horses, um, for jousting. I was oh. about to ask, I was like, how do you afford all this on a school teacher's budget? But he's also a uh, a bard. <laughs> So you make some money on the side. I don't know. Maybe they do horse. Well, a lot of times anything. people make pretty good money at, at the uh, Renaissance fairs. So maybe he maybe he has something else going on. If only I could crack that business. Yeah. Like, what would you want to do? Plan. I don't know. I would try to sell basically um, Merlin orbs, crystal balls. They'll be super high tech where it'll actually just be a viewer. Like a screen. You could plug anything into it, like an HDMI port. Mm-hmm. It'll be look like you're like Merlin. You're looking into a crystal ball when you're just looking at your next it's level. It's just pictures of your kids. And <laughs> pictures. It could be a video game. It could be the show. I see Tom Merritt. <laughs> I don't feel like watching or playing video games would would be a very good experience in an orb. Unless the game was designed for it, maybe. I don't know. Don't knock it till you try it. I want a Clydesdale horse. Oh, they're huge. They are huge horses. Oh, so beautiful. I don't even really like I'm not I can I can I can horseback ride sort of. All I remember was taking a horse and running free. So they're so maintenance heavy. Unless you really don't care about animals. They're, 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 no, no, I, I, yeah, I don't. That's, listen, this isn't, this isn't an issue I really have to address anytime soon. But at some point, I'm farm enabled. I will get a horse, a cow, and a pig, and one of get everything. geese. The geese are one of the best security animals around. Because they're so yappy. That's why Oakland's so safe. They're yappy, but they they have a they have a very um, they're very, very aggressive a tendency to bite you, like snip your backside. Yeah. We used to uh, when I was a little kid uh, because my parents both worked. I had to like go to someone's house after school for a few hours every day. And they were geese. And they were geese. It turns out, which is explains a lot. No, it was. But it, this is in Sebastopol, where I'm from. So everybody yeah, yeah. had eight, lots of acres and. The woman who took care of a bunch of us kids, uh, she had a bunch of geese in her backyard. She loved those geese. And they would chase you. 
and like t try to tear your clothes oh, off. Yeah, they were yeah. mean. They're mean. Right. They're mean. Everybody who goes to Lake Merritt in downtown Oakland looks at it and says, ha ha, Tom, it's named after you. And then they say, oh, look at all these pretty geese. And then the geese try to attack them. And then they say, those geese aren't very nice. No. I mean, they're they even can worse be. They can be. Can they, though? <laughs> they're Canadian geese. They are the no. least polite well, thing in Canada. Well, they, you know, they've got a cute waddle. Yeah, but that's just a physiology of their their lower half. I think the that Canadian that Canadian geese are like a horcrux for Canadian anger. The reason Canadians are so polite and nice is because all of their anger and frustration is channeled into their geese. No, it's channeled into hockey. Well, all, that too. You got there's some overflow. Hockey and geese, that pretty much is where all the anger in Canada has gone. Yeah. If you want a good farm pet animal, I highly recommend the llama. They're, pro they're, they're super chill if they know you, and they're very protective. Uh, the, guy, the guy's farm I was at, he used it to guard a sheep. They will also spit at you, though. Yeah, if, they, if, they, if you piss them off, so don't piss yeah. them off. The, lo the llama spit is, you know, it's I just can't wait. Gross. I can't wait. Okay, my sister has a farm. In fact, my sister has lived your dream to some extent, Sarah. Oh, uh, li lives on a farm out outside of Greenville, Illinois. Has kept cows and chickens and all of that, and cats and dogs and everything. <laughs> and that is my that is my dream. I so. can't wait someday to see Sarah with that kind of farm, and then Rogers <laughs> next door with his llama and his geese. Right, so, yeah. spitting and chasing children. Uh, but yes, my farm will be harmonious and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a farm. The, everything will be just flowers and you know. meet the geese at Rogers. Happy fun time farm. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to train those geese to pickpocket while they're busy <laughs> nabbing on your clothes. You're gonna be Come feed the llamas. llamas while the geese steal your money. Hey, that's a great deal because then they can't blame me. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. They learned it's it. geese. TV. What are you gonna do? They're Canadian. Yeah, they learn everything from YouTube. Entire nation's know, you anger is in their heads. What are you gonna do? I actually remember two of the geese that the geese would kind of come and go. You know, they'd die or I don't know. They'd go somewhere. And this is Canada. back in the day after school, uh, at the schoolhouse. And there were two geese that w that the woman who babysat me named Romeo and Juliet. And we thought that was so cute. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out that Juliet was a not Juliet. So it was Romeo and Julio. <laughs> <laughs> so totally so Juliet that. started identifying as Julio. Okay. This is good. I like this story. <laughs> Romeo and Julio. Yeah. And, and then it was just like the magic was over because the, we were like, no, that, well, I guess they could have been in love still, but yeah, it was I mean, you know, a Shakespearean why take that away from tragedy him? like we had been told. It did um, just a modernized spin. That's all. You're right. Yeah. Gosh, see these sort of deep rooted memories where we can stare <laughs> at each other. So, like on this idealized place, would you have a house with a big porch that you would sit in a rocking chair waiting for people to come up the road? I mean, that's literally what my sister does. She I has a she porch a and a rocking chair and a long driveway. It does sound nice. I've never really had a rocking chair. I'm not sure peaceful. how much I want a rocking chair, but I like the idea of a porch and just kind of sitting out watching yeah. the road by. Oh, I see the merits are back home. <laughs> you know, you know, you know what I don't quite understand is the whole trend of rocking chairs in airports all of a sudden. Oh, I haven't seen those. Yeah. I noticed that on a recent trip and I can't remember which, which gates, which airlines gates had those. It might've been in Heathrow. Well, but so yeah. the first time I noticed it, I was going to a wedding in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I flew into Knoxville. And and there were rocking chairs, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, they're kind of just, yeah, you know, like, it's like a, I don't know, we're in Tennessee. And so they've kind of decorated this airport in a certain way. But a lot of people were sitting in the rocking chairs. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've been at several different airports, and I see them there, too. There must be some sort of, like... Maybe it was JFK, then. Oh, it helps anxiety or some reason that, where it's, like, throw in some rocking chairs and people will complain less. yeah. Um, I like I like that idea though. Yeah. Do they provide you knitting needles? I guess not. It's an airport. You wouldn't. I think you do. probably have to bring your own knitting needles. Yeah, you probably can't bring them through the TSA either. Oh, you probably no. can. You know what? They'll have Depends knitting the needles gauge. attached to the chair 
by chains, but enough slack so you can bring your own yarn. And you Captain can... Jack's seen uh, rocking chairs at Logan Airport in Boston. Well, it's a whole thing. If anyone knows what's really going on there, please do share. In search okay. of the truth behind rocking chairs and airports. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. But uh, Facebook Nick... doesn't want you to know. <laughs> Nick with the C has posted a Verge article called How Rocking Chairs Ended Up in Airports. Oh, my gosh. That's great. Perfect, Nick. I it guess started instead of just with asking questions, I could Google things more often. <laughs> but isn't that's that how no we fun. used to do things before the internet? Shh, you'll take us out of a job, Sarah. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm so sorry to everybody who keeps emailing me about the Dodge Ram that I'm not selling. <laughs> it's so like, wait, how did how did the rocking chairs end up in airports? By the way, Zoe brings candy has it right below Nick. I, uh, like they both sure got to it right at the same time. They're, um, it turns out uh, they come from a guy named Champlain. Champlain. Oh, there's a church coming right there. The trend started by actually in 1997 at Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Whoa, okay. The airport had a temporary photography exhibit called Port Sitting. Okay. Uh, there were large photos of front porches with rocking chairs, and in front of the photos, as props, were actual rocking chairs. When the exhibit's time was up, they took the chairs away, and people got upset. We didn't realize how popular they were till they they went to remove the exhibit, Gentry says. We went to remove the rocking chairs, and we got such a public outcry that we said, wow, we need to keep these chairs here, and we expanded them. Hmm. Well, and there you go. Other airports and started there, to go. Went from airport to, the, uh, the idea spread from airport to airport. Just like a, a, a disease. Yeah. <laughs> so... Rocky well, you know, spread across the, airports like a like a virus. Yeah, like virus. a pandemic. Like viral, viral. Well, folks. well, I hope they serve uh, hot, like have a hot steam table with like mac and cheese and other food that you can just kind of nibble on while you're rocking. Lest you that, accuse us of having no Halloween spirit, I will once again don my costume. Costume, you know, folks, that was an actual unicorn that uh, Tom <laughs> managed to stalk. And <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't know that a true unicorn is aqua colored. Yeah, it's true. Otherwise, it's probably just a Pegasus dressing up. Yeah, yeah but don't back in be the day, fooled. We Pegasi everywhere, pretending to be unicorns. Is uh, Pegasi just... the plural of Pegasus? No, oh. no Pegasus was the actual name. Pegasuses sounds almost worse. Yeah. Winged horse. I hope everyone has a happy Halloween. Should you celebrate it? Uh, I hope that people outside the U.S. and Canada uh, can put up with us being an hour off for a few more days. We'll be back on target on Monday. But UTC followers, remember, will be jumping ahead an hour. We're at twenty thirty UTC right now, but after daylight savings hits. Uh, on Sunday, twenty-one thirty. It'll be twenty-one thirty. So, I think that's right. Not nineteen thirty. Twenty-one thirty. Take it from the unicorn. No, I looked it up earlier today. Actually. Yeah, because you go ahead. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, wait. Well, no. Hold on a second. UTC is the same right now, but when Beat, Man Beat Monster says UTC says the same right now, but when we switch daylight saving time, UTC will change because we won't be at the same time UTC. UTC hasn't changed even though other countries change daylight saving because UTC doesn't do daylight saving. It's very confusing. I don't know if any of you follow UTC, but it'll change because we're literally changing times by changing our clocks. It's a whole thing. Why don't, we just all, why don't we just all go with one time zone just from now on? It would be so nice. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching and supporting us. And we'll see you in November. See you in November. Bye. Bye.